There's this quote that I see floating around the internet quite a lot, and it's often attributed to Mark Twain. A gentleman is someone who knows how to play the banjo and doesn't. <laughs> the interesting thing about this quote is that Mark Twain probably never said it at all. I've found no one who's been able to tell me where or when or why he said this, and there are a billion other variations on it, so it's more than likely it's nothing more than an anonymous quip. But it's been misattributed to Twain. The banjo itself, too, is the subject of much misattribution. A huge chunk of the public associate its twangy timbre and unique design with backwoods country hicks, but this, too, is a misattribution, and it's this misattribution that brings me to you today. My name is Dexter Mueller, and I'm here to talk to you about the banjo's development from its Gordy origins to the steel string version we know today. Um, next slide. The banjo's roots are in Africa, in a large family of similar instruments. The one that shares the most similarities with the banjo is the Akanting of the Jolo tribe in West Africa. The defining characteristic of banjo-type instruments in Africa is the gourd construction. The banjo is only ever seen in the Western Hemisphere, but that quote up there, which is the first record of any banjo-type instruments, demonstrates that the basic concepts have been around for at least 400 years. Richard Jobson was an Englishman who explored the West African Gambian River, and he described an instrument not unlike the one I hold before you now, a gourd with a neck and strings. The banjo itself made its way to the, western, to, the, to the Western Hemisphere with the West African slave trade. The first sighting of the banjo was in the French Caribbean colony of Martinique, where it was known as a banza, and was used in small celebrations and gatherings by slaves. It eventually made its way into the U.S. where it was localized in Maryland and Northern Virginia in the 1700s and was known as an instrument for the slaves. It was seen as lesser and dirty. This is a depiction of some sort of slave ceremony, theorized to be either a dance or perhaps a marriage. Now, this painting is an important piece of art for a couple reasons, but this guy right there um, <laughs> is the reason that it's important right now. Oh, is that, okay. Um, what he's... <laughs> What he's playing is the earliest visual depiction of the banjo ever. You can see the similarities between the one he's playing and the one here. Uh, this one is my own design, so it's not exactly how old banjos were built, but it gets the general idea right. So, if the banjo was an instrument brought to the US by slaves and was seen as a slave instrument, how did it expand from that? The answer is not a very nice one. Minstrel shows were these very, very racist comedy routines that were hugely popular. They consisted of white performers donning blackface and appropriating slave culture, mocking slaves and simplifying their ways into digestible stereotypes that were lapped up by the masses. Joel Sweeney was one of these performers, and he was the first to bring the banjo into his routine. Having learned from a slave when he was young, Sweeney found lavish success, eventually touring Europe and playing in front of the Queen of England. His success spawned numerous copycats, which allowed the banjo to spread through the country. And more importantly, it made the banjo acceptable for the lower and middle classes. Up until this point, white people couldn't enjoy or play the banjo because it was seen as so connected to slaves. It would have been immoral, but when the banjo was used in a context of mockery, it allowed white people to get around the insecurity of enjoying a product of slave culture and thus enjoy the banjo. During this period, the banjo underwent its design changes. Back then, there were no fancy microphones or speakers, so instrument makers searched for other ways to make the banjo more suited for the large and rowdy crowds that would gather to listen to performers. Designers swapped gut strings for steel, replaced the gourd with a wooden med metal cylinder, and added a resonator and tone ring. The resonator is this chunky bit off the back, and you can see the tone ring in my banjo underneath the plastic head. These innovations changed the softer of the gourd banjo to the much larger and harsher of the steel string banjo. Frets were also added to make the banjo easier to play, so it was more accessible to new performers. Baltimore was the center of these innovations as it connected the industrious and technologically savvy North to the slave culture of the South, and it was a shipping center that provided access to raw materials and a good distribution method. Next slide. Uh, can I put this here? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a fancy stand for that one. Um, Eventually, the banjo moved from the lower classes into the good graces of the American elite, and the country entered a period I like to call banjo mania. 
This was a period of banjo virtuosos who brought the banjo into parlor music and orchestras, raising its status and allowing it to become universally enjoyed. This period started off thanks to the Civil War because generals would hire banjo players to keep troop morale up during camp, and the northerners who ventured into the south on campaign occasionally would take the banjo home with them, making the instrument even more ubiquitous amongst the country. When World War I hit, the isolationism created a newfound interest in American culture, and with this interest, the banjo flourished. Praised for its U.S.-based development, it found its ways into early New Orleans jazz and even wormed its way into Irish traditional music thanks to some enterprising Irish visitors. Additionally, around this time, instrument makers experimented with what could be a banjo, my favorite of which is pictured there. It's the Gibson upright banjo bass made in the 20s. After this golden age of the banjo, it disappeared from the public eye, which was due to the Great Depression. <laughs> <laughs> the banjo was a pretty expensive instrument due to the metals and woods involved in its construction, and it also had a very cheery sound. Neither of those traits meshed particularly well with the Great Depression, because the overarching themes of the time were sadness and poverty. <laughs> And so the banjo fell out of favor. It was replaced in parlors and orchestras with Gibson's archtop guitar, which, with a much cheaper construction and mellower sound. The banjo survived solely through its role in old time music, which is the oldest non-indigenous music genre in the US. Old time is a coverall term invented in 1923, which combined race records, which were records performed by black artists marketed at black audiences, and hillbilly music, which was southern and Appalachian versions of European folk songs and old gospel music, often incorporating the banjo. Old time was very informal, and most artists never were notable or recorded. Informal, small, and rural old time string bands were local community affairs that would often come together to play at a local dance to celebrate a community event, like a barn raising. Most old time was played claw hammer, which is a very percussive way to play the banjo. It's a strike on a string with your fingernail, followed by a strum of all the strings, and then a bounce of the short string with your thumb. It's a little out of tune right now, I'll fix that later. <laughs> Put together, you get a very boom chicka boom chicka rhythm. Excuse the out of tuneness. Mm. There is this one player, though, by the name of Snuffy Jenkins, who played three-finger old time. This was incredibly unique and was the inspiration for arguably the most important banjo player ever. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Earl Scruggs. He is legendary in the banjo realm because he single-handedly revitalized the banjo and created one of the core concepts of bluegrass. In 1945, he played with Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys live on the Grand Ole Opry and introduced the world to bluegrass's unique sound. Scruggs had a very special way of playing banjo, and his exposure on the Grand Ole Opry allowed him to reach an entire generation of listeners. Classic bluegrass banjo, also called Scrugg style or three finger style banjo, is characterized by rapid staccato notes, creating a syncopated and driving rhythm, and it is a defining feature of the bluegrass genre. I know that's a lot of musical jargon, so I'll demonstrate here by playing a Scruggs break made famous in the film Bonnie and Clyde, after I retune the banjo. Um, <laughs> and it is Foggy Mountain Breakdown. She doesn't do very good in the cold weather. <laughs> so Foggy Mountain Breakdown. <laughs> After spending... <laughs> After spending time with Monroe, he separated along with a bandmate named Lester Flat, and they formed their own band where Scruggs did some of his most influential works. He continued to play on the Grand Ole Opry and aspirational banjo players everywhere watched, listened, and learned, and imitated, eventually going on to form their own bluegrass bands and expanding the genre. Earl Scruggs brought the banjo back into the popular eye, and since then it has found a new niche in American music. In pop culture today, the banjo is used frequently in genres like country, folk rock, and alt rock. Think Taylor Swift and Mumford and Sons. But in these genres, the banjo is used le less for its uniqueness and musical virtue, and more for the messages that the banjo twang sends to the audience. Take this picture of Taylor Swift, for example. She's playing a six-string banjo, which is essentially a guitar on a banjo's frame. This eradicates the banjo's musical depth, but keeps the unique look and twang of a banjo 
and limiting the instrument to the rhythms and style of a guitar. This signals to her audience a vibe of rustic Americana, devaluing the musical and cultural history of the banjo by playing into a distilled, oversimplified image of the banjo, which was cemented into the cultural consciousness by the 1972 movie Deliverance with its iconic dueling banjo scene. You know. Yeah. where the banjo's twang was linked to murderous backwoods bumpkins, and the connection between the banjo and hillbillies remains strong today, as can be seen in that Finnish interpretation of American bluegrass down in the bottom right of the screen, where the costuming and vibe is clearly inspired by stereotypes of Appalachia. Ultimately, that's where the banjo stands today. Its use in old time and bluegrass remains strong, but in pop culture, it is little more than a calling card of the hillbilly, a far cry from the instrument's African roots. Thank you.